Um, I think I'd just like to mention one or two points that uh, might not be clear from uh, the other things that have been said. Uh, Sakho Mipam Rinpoche is one of the highest and most respected of the incarnate lamas of Tibet. Uh, his title, Sakyong, is a distinctive title which means earth protector. And it also denotes the fusion in the Shambhala tradition of the spiritual and the secular. He's regarded as what is referred to as a Dharma king, tracing his uh, lineage back to one of the great uh, spiritual and warrior kings of Tibet, King Gesar of Ling. He is also uh, an incarnation of one of the great uh, meditation masters of the previous century, uh, Mipam the Great, and as such, he is revered as an incarnation of the Bodhisattva of Wisdom, uh, Manjushri. But in addition to that impeccable Eastern uh, tradition, he is also a person who has been thoroughly raised and trained in uh, the Western arts way of thinking, and thinking, and thinking, and uh, it is uniquely a place to talk to us about ruling your world. Ripshay, please address us. So thank you and uh, welcome. I'm pleased to be here and delighted to have the opportunity to talk a little bit about um, my tradition. And I've, as Richard has mentioned, I'm sort of um, kind of right on the cusp between these two traditions. And these days, there's a lot of interest in meditation. There's a lot of interest in terms of alternate ways, in terms of how we lead our life. And I think one of the reasons that I, I chose um, this title of ruling our world, which has been pointed out to me on several occasions that it's not a very Buddhist sounding title. It sounds a little aggressive. But I think part of it is, is that I think there are many ways that we can go about leading our life. And I think one of the things that was sort of actually under, misunderstood in some ways in terms of the meditation tradition um, and Buddhism altogether is, is that it is not just simply a passive uh, practice. And what I mean by that is that one has to be proactive in one's life and proactive in terms of not using aggression particularly. And I think conventionally speaking, what people do is the way they go about trying to accomplish what they want is with a sense of aggression. And I think that's very predominant, obviously, and I think it's a lot of discussion taking place here. But it's really to do with how can we actually um, solve issues? How can we uh, have a decent life? How can we have a sane mind? Um, not um, completely based upon self-centeredness, but based upon uh, compassion, based upon wisdom, based upon meditation. And I think nowadays, obviously, there's a lot of work, and especially prominent, obviously, is the Dalai Lama in terms of somebody symbolizing this, uh, certainly for the Tibetan people. But also that um, the fact that um, we are here and discussing these topics in terms of how we go about doing this. And can we really engage in a world now um, using these uh, systems of compassion and understanding? And so, you know, obviously, uh, I'm here because I think so, and, and I'm not here to say, by the way, it doesn't work. And so I think it's very much a system of that it is a time, and I think there's a, obviously a tremendous material uh, development that's taking place. But ultimately, what I found in, in my upbringing is, is that practices like meditation and so forth are very normal in terms of if we want to relate if we want to have a good life, we want to be able to in integrate into the world, uh, we have physical disciplines. And what I was always struck with is, is that we learn how to do many things. We're sent to school for many, many aspects. But a lot of us do not have actually the training in terms of how to work with our mind. And so that's really what meditation practice is. And the notion of compassion in these things, I think often in the world what happens is that people say, you should be more compassionate, you should be more loving, you should be more this and that. And I think we demand that from each other to a certain point. And within my tradition, really, it's saying that one has to work on that. One has to develop that. The compassion in these things are not, they are there, they're dormant. And they're definitely part of our basic being, but they have to be cultivated. And that's really the notion of meditation, as opposed to meditation simply being time away from the world. It's very much in, engaged. In Tibetan, we say gom. Gom is the word for meditation. And it really literally means familiarity or getting used to accustomed. 
So what we're doing is in the process of meditating, we are taking those themes which are valuable to us in our life. So if, if a mindfulness is valuable, if a strong mind is valuable, if compassion is valuable, then the meditation session is very much that period in the day where we foster that. And I think in this particular way, then we get used to it. So there's a quality of integrating it. And I think one thing that's um, interesting for myself in terms of how we go about doing this, clearly here in the, in, in the Institute, and I mean, just even the term, the ideas and idea fest and so forth, is that we have a lot of good ideas. There's a lot of that comes forth. But really within the uh, tradition is, is that how do you actually cultivate it and how does it become a mainstay in our life? Because often what happens is that we do feel compassionate. We have that, but then all of a sudden, somebody says something irritating or spiteful or whatever and all of a sudden we get very angry and we kind of uh, blurt out and you know all of a sudden the compassion is gone i think the you know in our tradition one of the things is that like the classic example is if somebody's gone into meditation they've been sitting there for many many months if not years meditating on compassion thinking about how you know wonderful everyone is and then as soon as they get out of the meditation cave a dog goes running by and you know they take the nearest stone and throw it at, at the dog and saying, well, then, the, you know, 20 years of practice have gone out the window. So it's sort of like, well, how, how, how do you actually do this? And how do you foster it? And I think in this particular time, and for myself, being in this tradition, it's very, it's very easy to have the idea and to feel good about it, but one really has to be proactive. One has to engage and, and go forward in that particular direction. And I think in this way, um, it's very much looking at seeing um, what the source is. I think everyone, in a sense, has a desire to be happy. Everybody has a desire to want good things. And in, in, the, in the process of, of looking at it, often we go about it in the, in the wrong way or reverse way. So, you know, a lot of times in the um, meditation texts and so forth, they talk about this as kind of kokpa, or like we're being a fool. And uh, the, the quality here is, is that when we go about it, and I think a lot of us want to be happy, and how, how do we go about it? How is it that we foster it? A lot of times is that we get up in the morning and we say, I want to be happy. And one of the things that I, I try to encourage here is, is that often when we get up in the morning, as I was mentioning, meditation literally means familiarity. And people often say, oh, by the way, Rinpoche, I do or do not meditate. And I say, well, I can see what you mean, but technically, I say everybody's meditating because everybody is getting used to or familiarizing something with their mind as they go through. It may not necessarily be the best thing. So, you know, in meditation, people say, does meditation work or not? Of course, meditation works in the, in the sense because what you do is you put your mind on something and then you become familiar with it and you become strong with it. So in the same way, if you reverse it, you can say, I'm getting mad at somebody. And you think about it, and you are meditating upon that person. And then after a while, what happens is that you become a really good meditator. And all of a sudden, you blurt out something, and you, you say something negative. And so in the same way, you can reverse it and say, if you want peace or if you want compassion, how do you go about doing it? You have to be able to reverse the process. At some point in the day, we have to have that. And the notion of rulership here is, is that when you know it's, it's almost like saying if we are able to rule our world or if we're able to be able to have harmony in the world rulership here has more to do with harmony a sense of accomplishing what we want and we say true rulership here or true accomplishment is something that is not always sustained a short term and we all say anger and aggression is very short term it seems to be the most um, simple way to solve a problem so we get mad. But the thing is, it's very high maintenance, the whole process. So we have to get angry, or somebody has to behave in such a way. And when we begin to look at it, we say, either I change my attitude, or somehow develop some sort of inner idea of happiness or contentment. Or when I get up in the morning, in order for things to go well for me, how many factors have to come into place? I mean, so many factors have to come into place. We get up in the morning saying, what's going to happen? And essentially what we're talking about is, is everything going to go well for me today? And so the notion here is, is that that is not a rulership. In, in a sense, it's just holding on and hopefully things go well. And I think the notion of proactiveness is here that we instigate it. And instead of waking up and thinking, you know, what is my meditation? And for most of us, unfortunately, our meditation is what about me? It's always about what about me? And then, you know, if, if I go to the restaurant and so forth and I go out, it's very much, is everything going to be okay for me? 
And when somebody doesn't do something for me, all of a sudden, who is a person that actually feels the most pain? It is I. I feel the most pain. And so when, when I'm talking about this kind of quality and saying, stepping back and looking at it and saying, where is happiness in this kind of context? And it's not a matter of joy seeking, but it's a matter of just simply being able to be content and satisfied and happy. In Tibetan, we call this word, um, you know, satisfaction or contentment. And it's called chokshi. And it means knowing enough, knowing what is uh, good. And in, in our tradition, it is symbolized by the tiger. And many of you who have maybe seen pair of flags in Tibet, they're raised to the top of the mountain. And on that, you'll see animals such as the tiger, the lion, the garuda, the dragon, these symbols. And in Tibet, we call this lungta. It's called wind horse. And it is like life force vitality energy. And what happens is that you take it to the top of the mountain, and, you, and it flies high. And what it means is, is that um, I'm going to live my life based upon these principles of compassion, you know, strength, um, understanding. Uh, but I know that I have to develop these. And in this way, we call this basic goodness. We call it fundamental goodness, that if we sit and meditate, what do we find? What is it that is in us? And I always find this interesting because, you know, you may not find it interesting, but I find it interesting. And in that you know, in our tradition, we have brilliant people, scholars, and so forth. And they go away and they do. They're, you know, kind of, they understand metaphysics and everything. And then they say, what is at the deep, what is in our mind? What is at the heart of it? People meditate and have meditated for 20, 30, 40 years. And at the end of it, what is it that they find? You know, what do they come out saying? They say, actually, what at the base of the mind is the mind is good. It has compassion in it. It has all these elements in it. Now, you know, they don't come and say, you know, it's completely obscured and I'm a schmuck and all these kinds of things. Everything's going to go wrong and so forth. It's very much that there is this kind of clarity and brilliance. And what happens is that I think through the day, often we get distracted from this. In a sense, we know this. And, and I feel like, and, and there has to be some point, especially in this modern time, where it is very busy, our, our, our senses are constantly distracted, and we're unable to center. And I think this whole, you know, part of, um, I think, why I was asked to speak a little bit is in terms of the well-being track. And in terms of fundamental well-being is, is that if we have a centered and balanced mind in this way, that is, um, in a sense, to be expected. I think here what happens is that people either meditate, people, if, I remember it used to be like if people say, people say oh, do you meditate, there's something wrong with you. Why would you want to do that? Right here in, in my tradition saying, well, of course, if you want to have a, I always look at it very practically, if you want to have a healthy body and somebody says, by the way, I'm eating right and I'm exercising, nobody thinks they're crazy. In the same way, saying, well, what are you doing to strengthen your mind? What are you doing to develop compassion? What are you, do, what are you doing to develop these things? It's the same kind of thing. You develop the mind in this particular way. And I think nowadays, because there's so much stress, you know, a lot of, a lot of times is that <clears throat> we're unable to, um, you know, control is not a good word, but we're unable to hold our mind so that we, you know, create conflict and so forth. And it has come to the situation where what, what is it that we can do? And we realize that the source of well-beingness does come from the mind. From our tradition, we say that the mind um, because of the imbalance in the mind and irritation in the mind, that it begins to actually f um, affect the physical body. So therefore, illness comes about from that situation. Various things comes about from the situation. You can solve the exterior circumstances to a certain degree, but if you do not solve the, in in if you do not solve the root of the problem, it's a basic cause and effect situation. How can you deal with the basic essence of what is going on? And I think from this point of view, what I feel like we need to do is be able to support each other in terms of having an inner journey, uh, a journey which you know, we call it a journey of gewa or virtue. And virtue here is not necessarily meaning moralistic, but it really has a quality of developing these aspects. And one of the things that we all say is that if we begin to look at how we engage in our world, um, let's see what works. And we say that if we want happiness, the root of happiness, the fundamental root of happiness here is developing virtue. Virtue in a sense of generosity, patience, these aspects. And from the meditation point of view, we say all happiness comes from virtue. All suffering 
comes from non-virtue. Non-virtue here, and again, when I translate it into English, sometimes it has a little bit of a heavy moralistic connotation. In Tibetan, it doesn't. It has, a, it has more of a sense of fluidity and so forth. So in a sense, when one, one is loving, how does one feel? One feels buoyant, one feels open. The result of that is happiness. When one is angry, how does one feel? One feels tight. What is the result of that? It's suffering, not only for yourself, but for the others. And in this particular way, the session of meditation, the session of self-reflectiveness, which I think is very important to well-being, is a period where we have that. And I think more and more, as, as I've noticed that more and more people, more and more kind of in, engaging, we have to have some sort of personal um, understanding or discipline or contemplation or practice. <clears throat> So very much I, I encourage contemplation and how we contemplate, how we use our mind in this particular way. Because I think in the same way that we can be sitting here and that a lot of our things that happen throughout our day is a result of not being able to manage our mind in a particular way. So I've noticed in meditation, for example, that if we, just, if we sit here, most people say, by the way, um, you know, what is meditation? You simply... Uh, put the body in a posture where you can relax, where it's the least amount of distraction, and then you begin to focus on breathing, which is a very basic uh, technique. And what we begin to notice is, is that we have a lot of thoughts and ideas. And the notion of rulership, the notion of compassion, the notion of understanding is, is that, first of all, we have to gain the ability to have command um, to have, in, in, in Tibetan we call it rungwa, to be able to possess our mind. And one of the analogies that I always like to use is riding a horse. I know people like to ride horses here, and I, have grown, I grew up riding horses. And the notion is, is that when you ride a horse, um, you, 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 know, you tell it what to do, and it does that. But conventionally speaking, when uh, most of us, sort of our mind is more like a, ho a wild horse, a horse that has not been trained. And so what does that feel like? You know, it feels like in the morning you get up and you get on your horse and then you say, horse, you know, and if the horse is your mind, by the way, and you can look at your mind and say, mind, what kind of day are we going to have? You know, and we, and, and we can tell a horse, I want to go right or I want to go left. And if we do not have any command of the horse, we just hope the horse goes in the right direction. And for most of us, you know, when we say, what is a good day? By the, we say, by the way, how was your day? I said, I had a good day. That's the day that our mind followed what we wanted it to do. You know, the, our mind kind of fo followed it. And a lot of times what we, what, we, what we feel like is we just say, that is just how my mind is. You know, my mind is just like that. So what we're actually saying is, is that we should be able to have possession or control or, over our mind. And the process of meditation is that synchronicity is that ability. And so what does a discursive mind feel like? It's a mind where a thought comes up and all of a sudden we're gone with the thought. We have no control. And in meditation, sometimes people say, oh, you're trying to not think. I say, well, no, we're not trying to not think. What we're trying to do is saying, we're trying to say, I have a choice whether I want to think or I don't want to think. I have a choice whether I want to get angry or do not want to get angry. You know, I should have that ability if it is my mind in this particular way. So if we have that, if we have rulership of our own mind, then obviously, then in, in terms of everything else that follows, we can have rulership in terms of our whole life. So it's, it's very much following this way. And from our kind of um, you know, tradition of this, relating with this stuff, uh, Tibetans, again, obviously, as I mentioned, like to put animals with every kind of theme. So the theme is, is that once we have some synchronicity with our mind, how does that feel like? We say it feels like the snow lion. And the snow lion is a, is a creature, some people say it's mythical, if you ask most Tibetans. And next time you see the Dalai Lama, you can ask him uh, what he thinks. And uh, one of my teachers came here, a very old <clears throat> teacher, and he said, oh, do they have uh, snow frogs over here? And I go, what? You know, he said, do they have snow frogs? And I go, I, I don't think they have snow frogs. And he goes, well, that's too bad. And I said, well, why is it too bad? He goes, well, where you find snow frogs, you find snow lions. And I go, oh, OK. I said, that, that makes a lot of sense. 
And um, the, you know, the, the snow lion in Tibet is known as a, is a, as a, as a creature that is um, uh, full of joy and vitality. And the notion here is, is that it is symbolizing the joy and um, contained within the mind having been developed. And I think this is very much a notion of well-being. How is it that we can accomplish this? How is it we can do this? And I think you know, one of the things that you know, out of this um, time, and I'm, I'm sure people are here because of just curiosity, but also there's a quality. I, I really feel like that everyone has the ability and has the ability to be able to develop this. And one thing that I always try to encourage people is, is that when you're doing meditation, when you're doing these things, um, don't overdo it. I always tell people, if you're going to meditate, meditate very briefly, very short amount of time. A lot of t people come to me and say, I'm really excited about this, and they go off, and it's like eating too big of a meal. You know, you, you get a stomachache afterwards, and they say, I'm, I'm not sure about that meditation, I'm not sure about this. But really what you have to do is manage it. Manage it very briefly. And I think within even this context, to center ourselves, there's a lot of ideas going on, letting them sink, letting them develop, and then coming about. And so a lot of the theme here is to do with compassion, is to do with understanding. And why, why is it that we would do this? Um, we say, actually, one of the biggest secrets is, is that a lot of times we go about trying to be happy ourselves. And the reason we go, reason, a lot of times we are unhappy in a sense, is, is that it is for ourselves. And we say the secret of happiness is actually doing something for others, you know, having it for others. And it was very interesting because when I um, presented, um, you know, to, uh, to write a book, people wanted some more esoteric stuff. And my publisher asked me, he said, you know, what's the catch of the book? You know, what's the sound bite? And I said, well, I'm not sure if there's a sound bite. And I said, what's the theme of the book? And I said, well, help others and you'll be happy. And they didn't like that too much. It didn't go over too well. And I said, but the thing is, is that that's really, that's really you know, for my tradition and the people who I know who, who are accomplished. And I guess it was interesting for me before because years ago, um, one of the first time that uh, His Holiness Dalai Lama came here, um, I was with him, and we, we, actually, we were actually in a different place in the United States. And uh, he was unknown, and he was talking about, in a sense, of compassion. And people saying, that's ridiculous, it's not going to work. And slowly, over time, his message has gotten out. And one thing that I always say is, is that how many, you know, I tell this to the Tibetans. And I, when I go back to Tibet, I say, please continue your spiritual tradition. Please continue this, the tradition where it is actually, Tibet is known for a place where you live your life upon the principles of helping others, you know, thinking about others. And when I talk to them, I say, how many Tibetans are there in the world? Probably maybe at the most six million. And I said, how many other <clears throat> kind of refugee groups are there in the world? There's many, many. And why is it that Tibetans are so well known? And I always joke with them. I said, it's not because of our food. You know, our food is like, I would say our food is sort of like the Scottish food of Asia, you know? It's, there's, there's not much to it. And when I see Tibetan restaurants, I say, well, what are they serving? You know, like, it's, 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 you know, barley and, and boiled meat, and, and that's about it. And, uh, you know, I say, no, it's, it's because of our rich tradition. And not only that, it's, tr it's based upon a tradition where people have been put to the most extreme situation. The country has been taken away, they've been tortured, and so forth. I've talked to these individuals, and when I talk to them, you know, when I go back to Tibet, uh, some of the old lamas, and they can tell me, you know, in privacy, if they are bitter, if they are angry. No, they don't, they, 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 I don't feel that, and they don't have to pretend to me. They say, you know, um, we tr what we try to do is we didn't want to lose our dignity, so we have compassion. You know, and some people say, well, obviously, your compassion lost your country. I mean, you know, there's many ways of looking at it. But the thing is, is that in terms of the effect that it has had, and I feel like if there's one message, is that in particular in this time, at an individual level, and really, one of the, one of the texts that I used um, to, for this book on rulership was actually a, an ancient Buddhist king who was being educated, and his tutors were telling him, if you really want to have rulership, it has to be based upon compassion. It has to be based upon helping others. Because when 
when, when, when you don't do that, it's by aggression. It is always suppression. People are always trying to get away. People are always doing things behind your back. They're gossiping and doing all kinds of things. But when you get up in the morning and your intention is to help those, then people are loyal, they're loving. And when you have love and bondage, then people work very hard for, in, in both ways. So it, in principle, I feel like that is sort of what we're trying to, what kind of world are we creating? <clears throat> what, is it, what is the message we are trying to send? And there have been communities that have been based upon this. There, there have been actually, not, not just monks, but there have been lay people and business people and so forth. And when we look at it even from a very you know, technical point of view, we say the mind, when you look at the mind, those individuals who are compassionate, what, are, what do you get from them? They are happier people. There are, it, it, there are individuals who have a bigger mind. And nowadays what people are doing is they need scientific proof, which I think is important. But they're saying when somebody is in a compassionate state, their mind is more nimble. They're able to understand more things. They're able to balance more ideas. They're able to be, make uh, better decisions. You know, it may be all, all the, maybe in this uh, day and age, it comes down to if you make a better decision, you make more money or something. But it comes down to this quality. And so now they're doing, you know, I'm sure some of you are aware, scientific tests on this kind of stuff, which is very interesting. And people say to me, by the way, did you hear that this, you know, Harvard basically has uh, agreed that meditation works? You know? And uh, you know, you know, how does that make you feel? And I said, well, obviously, I didn't need that level of proof, but I appreciate it. You know? But I think it's, you know, for our day and age, I think it's very important, because we, we are very kind of material, empirical kind of tradition, and, and we look at what works. And I think part of what we're talking about here is, is that there's inner development. There's a lot of ideas. How do we integrate it? How do we foster it? And contemplative meditation, where we take our thought, whatever it is, compassion, loving kindness, the thought, may, may others not suffer, and, fo and foster that. And for a lot of us, it's very hard. I notice a lot of times when people go to India, it's, you know, it's either black and white. It's either they are overwhelmed by the kind of poverty that they see, and then they give away all their money, or they're, they don't know what to do and they don't do anything. It's like you have to have a middle road here. You have to have a road where you can help, you, you foster it. And in the same way, there's so much coming at us, we have to develop these ideas. And I feel like compassion doesn't have to be saving the world as such, but it has to do with having enough understanding, developing that open mind and heart where we can see our family, we can see those around us. Otherwise, we become very, very isolated in this particular way. And you know, the only thing I would like to share is, is that a lot of this may, I mean, there's a lot of technical aspects to it, but I would like to say that the, you know, the influence and on myself and why I'm here and so forth is, is that the people who I've learned from, they're very kind of decent people and they're very happy people. And what I've noticed is, is that you know, in, in my tradition, like they're a lot of older, and the older they get, the uh, the more childlike they get. And as they get older, they are less uptight, and they are less kind of concerned. And it's always interesting to me because you see these great masters, and you think they must know a lot of stuff. And when you meet with them, it's like hanging out with a kid, you know. And you know that they know a lot of stuff, and they, but they don't have to prove it. And they're very buoyant in this particular way. And if I was sitting there and I was meditating all of a sudden, and my teacher getting more and more uptight, it'd make me a little bit nervous, you know? And so it's interesting in this particular way. It, it's it's how, how is it that it's working? And I think a lot of times in our society, we learn a lot of knowledge, but is that knowledge liberating? Is it, make, is it make, bringing us more levity? I mean, it's not to do with it's not serious. A lot of times things are very serious. That doesn't mean we have to become down on ourselves in this particular way. So I feel like here, the notion of how we're going about engaging in our world, we're at a, we're at a time where um, these, these themes seemed very far-fetched, but now, obviously, some of you in your own fields and so forth, <clears throat> prominence you know, and engage, it's like here we are in a world where we're trying to mix. And I feel like it's already um, inherent. I don't feel like it's an Eastern, Western thing. It's an inherent thing. How do we develop it? And one of the things that I always try to do with meditation and these things is demystify the process. How do you do it? And one thing I, I don't like is like saying, well, that's, 
That's what they do. I grew up in the tradition where, again, like I was mentioning, it's very normal. And so I think the more we can relax and say, the more we can have the ability to work with mind, compassion, understanding, so forth, and that we raise our children in this way, that they have the ability to do this. You know, it's, it's much, it, it br brings into a world where we can interchange much more easily. So again, you know, I feel like there's um, a level of we would like understanding to take place, but understanding, at least from my experience, is something that we have to work at personally too. We have to be able to listen to those next to us, not only you know, our spouses and our friends, but then we're talking about a different culture, a culture that doesn't even agree with the same principles. And then all of a sudden, we're testing it to that level. It's very difficult. And I think you know, it's, it's how do you make those incremental steps. So if we can listen a little bit to those around us and then um, and contemplate and develop those aspects, then it has a much more far-reaching effect. So um, I thought that just with the time that we have, we could do a very brief uh, meditation. And it's, it's very simple. And I know that I was given um, three hours to do meditation. I hope that's OK with you. <laughs> So we'll just do it for one or two minutes. And again, I, I don't want to, as I said, demystification. You don't need to be sitting on cushions. Chairs are fine. Just basically what we're doing is uh, it's called familiarity. And what we're doing is familiarizing ourselves with what is helpful. And generally speaking, as especially here, a lot of ideas and so forth, we're trying to center ourselves. And the best way to do that is for our mind to be in the present moment. So instead of our mind drifting to the future or the past, of being present and what is present is the breathing. The breathing is very present. And so this kind of meditation is called Shine, developing harmony, developing peace. So you can just put your hands on your thighs. You know, it's just basically having a correct posture so you can breathe. There's a relationship between the breathing and the mind. If you change your body, you'll, you'll begin to notice it'll affect your thinking process. So just exhale. And then inhale. So this is simply going back and forth. And again, just in the back of our mind, we know that there are many things going on. But right now, what's helpful for us right at this moment is developing strength of mind, clarity of mind, centeredness of mind. Just appreciating being alive, no matter what's going on. We feel fortunate to be alive and to be here. If we notice that we begin to drift, our mind's drifting, it's very normal. We just bring it back to the breath. And we're saying, I don't want to be thinking right now, I just want to be Going back to the breathing. Even though there's sounds going on, it's just simply we're sitting here, exhaling and inhaling. It's important not to be fooled by in our inactivity. We're not doing nothing. We're doing something very prominent and important. The mind is at the core of all our experiences.
Again, if you find your mind drifting away, just come feel the breathing, exhalation. It's like being next to a stream. It's not still, it's just moving, but you're present. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not sure how you do this, but if, if there's time, people can ask questions, or we just, you know. Just let me get a hand towel. Just one minute. Um, thank you very much. It was a wonderful session. I um, uh, am a scientist, and I, I do a lot of unconscious thinking when I'm exercising, when I'm walking. As a matter of fact, my daughter always says, your mind's going so fast, you better not trip over some piece of concrete or something. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I appreciate the opportunity to quiet the mind and simply pay attention to breathing. Mm -hmm. But do you think there's a value to the unconscious activity of the mind in the background while you're concentrating on the breathing? And how do you integrate the two processes? Yeah, I think that there's, um, there's two kinds of uh, meditation. One is the <clears throat> what we call the peace meditation, harmony meditation. And that is to do with uh, centering the mind and calming it down, developing the ability uh, not to be dragged away by your thoughts. And we're talking about gross thoughts and fantasies where you're totally spaced out. And as we do, as we do that, our mind literally becomes stronger. So I think this is something that, again, as a scientist, people are realizing that people who have meditation, apparently part of their brain and the organs they actually changes as you develop the ability for your mind to be stronger. The way I like to think about it, because it's a physical world, it's like weightlifting or something. Every time you do repetition, you get stronger. And in the same way, every time you bring your mind back, your mind is actually getting stronger. And so there's a sense of that you want that ability. Now, at the same time, the mind is always perpetually moving. It's, it's a, you know, and it's, they say in a Buddhist terminology, they say it's uh, recreating itself at least 360 times in a, sec in a snap of a finger. So it's a, it's a movement process. And so, but we don't have that level of uh, sensitivity to see that. What we see is random thoughts and images coming. And so what we want to do is first to have the ability to have some space in the mind so that then you can bring your prominent ideas into your s sphere. So if you're trying to you know, contemplate certain, you know, I'm not sure what area you're, you know, you're dealing with, but you want to bring that in, and that's called contemplative meditation. And in Tibetan we call it tun gomba. Tun means meaning or we call it chegom or analytical meditation. So you analyze and look at something. And as you analyze, now if you analyze without a steady mind, then you can draw very little conclusion to it. So what you do is, but you need the first one or do the second one. But it's not necessarily a sequential step. You don't spend months and months just doing one and then going to another one. What you do is you develop a certain amount and you come back and forth. So it's a very cyclical process. You do one thing and you come back. And you know, as, as you're mentioning, then once you have the ability, then when you are engaged in gardening, walking, bicycling, whatever it may be, you have the ability to remain focused and have an idea. But what you want to do is make sure that those ideas are not, in a sense, uh, destabilizing. Because otherwise, then what happens is the mind gets turned, and all of a sudden you get very random thoughts coming, and then you get totally distracted. So I think it's a balance. And I think one thing is, is that, you know, in our tradition, we say kong gomba yabu yures, which means he's a good meditator. And what that means is the ability of the individual to be able to determine what's enough in this sphere. So how to go back and forth. So I think it's very much, you know, as opposed to, I think a lot of times people get too simplistic with meditation and, and it's just they only know one technique. You have to know a couple of techniques because the mind is very clever, as you know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. There's one here. Yes, it, it seemed when you talked about happiness and contentment that possibly happiness and contentment is not a place to go to but a place to come from right I think it's um, contentment is is the is the result in a sense um, and you know intention is intention is the cause 
And also what you're saying in terms of that intention is out of a happiness, is out of a, um, um, uh, a good thought, you know, um, happiness, intention. When you have the thought and intention of wanting to do something, it provides, and a lot of times when we use, at least in Buddhism, when we use a logic, we don't say it's a particularly line, linear logic. It's a cyclical logic in a sense. You'll have a moment where you arise up and you'll have a moment of um, insight and happiness that comes about, and then that creates further happiness. And I think that's really what we're talking about. But what I, you know, what I, the only thing I was trying to present is, is that a lot of times we think happiness is just sort of ac accidental. And really what we're saying is, is that from when you look at the mind, Every, every kind of experience you're happening has to have a cause and a, and a condition. So what causes and conditions are creating it? And I think that is just more to be curious about that. You talked about um, meditation leading to compassion. Mm -hmm. How does meditation lead to compassion? And are there special processes that you use to achieve that? Um, definitely. I, I think that I think one thing that's important is to understand is that meditation is not the goal, it's the path, it's the process. So it's the same thing, like for example, if you know, those of you who know kind of the, the story of the Buddha, the Buddha meditated, but after meditating for six years, he got up and engaged. So compa there's, in, there's in, you know, contemplative compassion generating it as you're meditating, and then there's engaged meditation. So we say, in order to have compassion, you have to have it at two stages. You have to develop the intention, the motivation. And in Tibetan, we call it kunlong. Kunlong is a word that means for the mind to rise up. It's kind of very closely connected with the English word to be inspired or spirit. When you have spirit, you're engaged. And my understanding is also the word spirit also has to do with mindfulness. So the notion is when your mind is engaged to do something. So then meditation means you just get more and more comfortable and strengthen that quality of engagement of compassion. And compassion here, you know, I mean, in terms of what this process is saying, is compassion is the thought and intention for the suffering of others to cease. So when you see a dog like being hit by a car, when you see that, your first reaction, visceral reaction before you know, the reasons is that you just want it to stop. You don't want that pain to take place. That is deep-rooted compassion. That's an immediate aspect of our mind. Our immediate aspect is good, I'm glad the dog's gone. We don't think that. Later we say, well, it was an obnoxious dog, whatever it may be. But in, initially, it's that. And the notion is that that's an aspect of the mind. It's, you know, an in, innate part of the mind. So we say that in order to bring that about, we become more familiar with it. But often what happens is that we are two or three or four thoughts ahead of that. So when we see somebody, we don't see their suffering. So later, when we're more relaxed, we say, you know, the reason the person cut me off in traffic was because they're late and their child's at home sick, you know? And then we have compassion, we are more understanding. But initially, all we see is, you know, that something's wrong. And then the next stage really here is developing that aspect, you know? And then once you have that, then you're, you're you know, you're, your, your ability to actually want to help. And uh, then I think, you know, then your life begins to change because all of a sudden it's much, more, it's much more open. And they say the mind that is compassionate is a more open mind in a sense that it is a mind that sees more what's going on because that's the reality of what's actually taking place. We're not saying we're not creating suffering. Suffering is already taking place. We are noticing it. What is the obvious reaction you should have towards suffering? you would like it to cease, you know? And then, how do you do that? I want to ask a bit more about how meditation can be used as a process for achieving compassion and ultimately social justice. I, I work in the field of human rights where I work through networks where we're <coughs> trying to achieve social justice, right. but oftentimes, um, uh, we found in these networks that while we're trying to achieve social justice through human rights, we're not actually applying human rights to our own relationships with, with each other right, because exactly. there's so com much competition over resources and recognition and so forth. And we've talked about that. How can we apply human rights to our own personal relationships? And so I'm wondering how, how, what meditation can teach us about, um, uh, about achieving compassion, our personal relationships with each other in a deeply competitive world, sure. and how that can be a step toward achieving social justice. 
Well, I think, you know, one thing is, is that um, compassion allows the individuals to be more content and happy. And so when that happens, we say um, a compassionate mind, a personal mind of compassion, is much more strong and sustaining. So an individual who is compassionate has more fortitude. So you actually will be, in the long run, being able to sustain and be more active and to continue. So one of the things, it's just very practical in the sense that we need to develop ourselves because if you want to accomplish what you want, social justice, that is a long-term goal. And I think one of the things we're talking about here is, is that we say, um, you know, compassion, the path of peace is slower, but it's ultimately uh, stronger and it's more sustained. So I think the quality here is, is that we need to be able to internalize that and see that. And through the process of ourselves, working with our own mind. And when you do compassion, you know, you, you bring up images in your mind saying, you know, I was an idiot, why did I do that and do this? As you work through this, you develop compassion for yourself. You understand your mind more. So when you begin to relate with other people and they do stupid things, you have much more basis of understanding, as opposed to just being very tight and all of a sudden bouncing back. And then all of a sudden, you create a bad image for your cause. You know, because all of a sudden they say, well, you know, they're, they're upset. You know, why should we listen to them? What do they have to offer us? And I think really here it's a process. And I think it's a quality where, you know, we're not going to do it perfectly ourselves, but we need that basis. And, you know, and I think that it's, it's a quality of you should be happy and the more kind of not ha-ha happy, but the quality of synchronicity and enjoyment of what you're doing. And what I've noticed is in a lot of social causes is that people get burnt out. And you know, all of a sudden they're fine, but four years later they're no longer doing it, or they get used up. And you know, the thing is, is that what I've noticed with Liz talking, talking about people who I learned from, they're, they keep going. It's a very, you get this very strong sense it's not going to run out. And I think that has to be integrated. And that's true, genuine, under, like that's not just thinking it's kind of real, but feeling it's real. And there has to be you know, that quality. <laughs> So meditation, <clears throat> again, just take the word away from what it is. It's like saying, I would like compassion. What is the process? I need to develop it. And we say, if you're very skilled, you can develop compassion as you do it. But thus, those individuals who are very skilled, the rest of us who are a little slower have to take time and meditate and develop it quietly and then apply it. And then it gets tested and you go back and forth. Thank you. I think that's the end of our time, but I'd invite you to join the Sakyong at the bookstore at Pepke for a book signing. Thank you very much. Thank you.